So hello everybody, thanks for joining us. Thanks for taking time out of your busy schedules um, to join the discussion. I know a lot of you are out there keeping our lights on, our oil and water systems flowing, and, and a whole lot of other areas of critical infrastructure uh, that we rely on. So it's an honor that you uh, you know, carve some time out to, to spend some time with us today. Um, we've gathered some really good, really smart folks today um, and experienced folks to talk about the cybersecurity programs and industrial environments and how we can get those working effectively contributing to the mission. To introduce myself, uh, as Megan mentioned, my name is Sam Van Ryder. I'm with Dragos. I work with our largest customers on their OT security programs. And I've been focused in the industry for about the past dozen years or so in a background in mechanical engineering. Um, on our panel, more importantly, I have, uh, I'd like to introduce you to uh, first Dave Boos. Dave Boos is uh, the Security Solutions Program Manager of Emerson for the Power and Water Industries. In that role, David is responsible for setting the direction of Emerson Security Solutions business, including establishing product and service roadmaps, providing sales support, and leading the Ovation Cyber Emergency Response Team. David frequently presents on the topics of cybersecurity and industrial assault control system protections at industry conferences and trade shows, and is active in the threat intelligence community insurance team, ensuring that Emerson is able to provide timely notification to its user base regarding current threats and malware campaigns. We also have Eric Anderson, who is an embedded um, sales engineer for McAfee, especially specializing in security solutions for embedded systems, such as industrial control systems, point of sale devices, ATMs, healthcare devices, and similar domains. Prior to working for McAfee, Eric was a systems engineer for Westinghouse Electric and designing and implementing cybersecurity for their automation platform. And prior to that, he was also an engineer for Raytheon Information Intelligence Systems and CryptoLogic officer in the U.S. Navy. We're also joined by Josh Carlson, who possesses almost 20 years of diverse cybersecurity experience in engineering and business development roles within high-tech companies, supporting U.S. and Middle Eastern governments, global financial institutions, as well as customers in energy, oil and gas, petrochemical, paper, coal, water, wastewater, utilities, and manufacturing. His most recent experience is focused on industrial control systems that are often used in critical infrastructure. Um, he serves as the Senior Business Development Manager here at Dragos, um, where he primarily focuses on strategic alliances and technical integrations on various solutions with the Dragos platform offering. Prior to that, he led the Cybersecurity Initiatives Services Initiative at Schneider Electric. I'll also note that he spends a lot of time volunteering with organizations such as ISA, uh, Global Security Alliance, and is co-chairing their new Cybersecurity Standards Implementation Conference. So from that, Introduction, let's uh, get into the meat of it. So, Jets, over the past year, we've seen a lot of incredible developments across the industries, a lot of attention focused on industrial environments. Um, in April, we saw the Colonial Pipeline event, of course. Everyone knows widely about this, and that really crippled the fuel supply to a large area of the Eastern Seaboard, which made it painfully obvious to everybody, not just those of us doing this, but a lot of folks that are the consumers, how, how important critical infrastructure is to all of us. And then in June, we saw JBL, a major supplier, get hit with ransomware. And then we had the most recent three U.S. grain uh, distributors that fell victim to the same method. And then that impacted the supply, the food supply chain. So more impacts to consumers. Um, in parallel to this, we've seen the administration act. So Biden administration had released the 100-day plan. Uh, we saw this with utilities. We've seen TSA also release directives for the pipelines. We're also seeing other uh, things come up for rail, for uh, transportation, water, uh, and things like that that are coming as well down the pipe. Uh, excuse the pun. But so, given the further, given given all of this that's happening, there's a lot of attention on these systems. There's a lot of attention on critical infrastructure, and understandably and rightfully so. That being said, we all have worked with these environments for a long time. We know that some of these organizations are further along in the cyber journey in OT than others but many will still need to jumpstart their programs. So this really leads to the first question for the panel. So what's a proven approach to implementing effective cybersecurity visibility detection and response enablement for OT systems? And where should you start? So Eric, would you like to kick us off? Sure. Well, for, uh, for the last decade or so, uh, the de default approach has been to identify assets, uh, harden them, and then go supply security controls. 
the, the hardening, securing, and detection part, those are managed by plant system engineers. Here, this, this security part is an OT activity. And in general, this works, but I, I think we all uh, noted this when we were talking about this. I'm still seeing customers who are stuck at that asset inventory stage. We're still having trouble identifying assets. Um, additionally, some mature organizations will do security monitoring response and even some detection by exporting data to security analysts uh, outside the plant. It's usually one-way communication. This part is more of an IT activity and it works fairly well, but it's still inefficient and um, information is lost in the process. But I want to go back to the term proven. Um, are these solutions proven because they actually prevented a targeted attack or is it because they passed an audit? Uh, the, the established solutions, as, as we know, have defended well against attacks where someone accidentally infects a system. Um, usually it's random malware, not something that was intended to go on that system. And, and these defenses have been sufficient in the past because the plant wasn't deliberately being attacked. But now we're seeing more targeted attacks against industrial targets and, and ransomware and things like that. And it's not just Ukrainian power plants or Iranian nuclear facilities. Yeah, Eric, I, I like what you said there um, about the word proven. I think oftentimes it's, it's a subjective word, um, especially when it comes to um, industrial control systems um, that have, you know, proven safety and reliability records that oftentimes will, will span decades. Um, I think one essential component that everyone needs to agree on is that just like with safety and, and reliability, um, this is going to be a journey. Um, it's going to be an, a continuous improvement process. Uh, when it comes to the word effective, I think it's uh, most people will agree that, it's, that that is a bit more objective. Um, therefore, uh, to gauge your level of visibility, detection, response, effectiveness, you first have to start with that comprehensive assessment, right? You have to seek to understand what data points do I have within my people, within my processes, within my procedures, within my networks, my systems, my devices, right? You already know um, about that. Um, but what, they, what that will then produce, right, is a report that highlights those blind spots in your organization. I think the best part is that this report then helps to build the requirements for the next steps in that journey. Um, you know, find the solutions that can improve your overall effectiveness for visibility detection response. Um, and just to be clear, I'm not just talking about technology, although they can help, right? It, it can be other improvements within people or processes as well. And I'll, I'll go ahead and jump on that one too. But I, you know, I think, I think yeah, it always is, a, is the idiom basically uh, that you can't protect what you can't see. And you can't fix what you don't know about. Um, that's why our kids are so good at hiding stuff from us. Uh, there's uh, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, however, there is reasons why very large organizations make a lot of money at selling asset inventories, uh, what it comes down to. Uh, just you get finding out about things they didn't know about. They make six figures easily per engagement to come out and take a look and tell you where stuff is. Uh, it's going to be very difficult and it's going to always be a sprawl issue and it's going to get worse as we digitally transform. I said it, you can now mark that one off. Uh, uh, most of our environments. Uh, the the But I would also state while you're doing it, it, just finding out what stuff is and where stuff is, is your number one thing. And it doesn't matter. I'm not saying do a full asset inventory. I'm saying, do you even know what you even have out there right now? Because a lot of times uh, we, when we put in systems for people, we provide certain capabilities uh, or products alongside of it, and I've seen it sit unused or unmaintained or un unmonitored for the life of the, of the system, and they weren't even aware that they could do things with it. So I know no one has budget for, for brand new, generally. So have you taken a look to see what capabilities are there and, and uh, try to reuse what is available that would normally give you operational awareness for security awareness? Uh, so there may be certain tools to be reran, and um, and perhaps give you not 100% security 
tool like things, but maybe at least give you a way to view when something abnormal happens. So start with finding out what you actually have and how you can use it. Make uh, some excellent points across the board there. And that really uh, segues well into our next question about this different types of security technologies, right? So what types of those technologies have automation vendors integrated into their ecosystem? And why is that? Josh, I'll pick on you again. Sounds good. Thanks, Sam. Um, I think in the beginning, at least in, in my experience, and in, in, you know, almost a decade of doing this specifically for OT, but even just in cybersecurity for a couple decades now in general, in the beginning, um, regulations that had a lot of language around shall statement um, often drove the automation vendors to incorporate various pieces of technology into their offerings, right? So basically customers, uh, regulations wrote it, customers said, hey, I have to comply, and so you shall provide me this. And so they kind of did um, did it from that perspective. And again, this helped in a lot of ways establish a baseline of recommended and good security practices. Uh, unfortunately, as cyber threats continue to evolve, organizations must adequately understand if their cyber solutions are still reducing risks by giving them proactive and reactive capabilities. Um, this is where cybersecurity companies themselves also must evolve and adapt, right? Because if you just stay in one spot, adversaries are going to pivot and move and, and your solutions are not going to be uh, providing the same value that they were even yesterday. Um, because it's more than just about detective, protective, um, and responsive technologies. Um, I think it's more about the cybersecurity company's ability, right, the company itself, their ability to adjust and support the end users where they're at today and then provide value against the threats they're facing right now and potentially in the future. What do you think, Dave? Well, yeah, I, you know, if you look at any kind of new new technology wise uh, or, or anything that's new, uh, everybody eventually equal. It's you always start out with new features as, as a differentiator for most companies or most products. Uh, I, I remember back in the days, I'm sure some of us are old enough to remember the first time there ever was a value meal. And so going to McDonald's was uh, a fit new because you now got this bundled deal of drink and, and fries and a, and a burger and no one else did it until suddenly everybody else did it. Uh, so everybody had their own version of value meal. Uh, when you first start with the start solving a problem in the uh, this space, especially technology wise, the features, this product can find uh, PLCs and query for the ladder logic on the PLC. Uh, if that is an actual feature that helps uh, advance security pretty well, then eventually every product does that uh, if you if you long enough maturity in the in the product line. So when it comes down to eventually, as we know with all PLCs or most control systems, you're not going to find too many really unique items just for this one company that does the thing that everybody needs it to do. Eventually, everybody's going to build that in that kind of support. So after maturity level is reached, you end up with a a feature parity, and then it comes down to cost and price availability, and eventually, who do you want to do business with? Uh, so at this point, uh, perhaps I pick this uh, working with a particular company because of the supply chain, uh, because of who I as my business is easier to purchase from them. Is it, are they well known? How, what's the support look like? Um, because again, I don't want to buy a thing and never hear from them again or never be able to, uh, so I don't buy anything off of eBay. Uh, so you, it may be very difficult to ever get support or return it. Uh, so it, this is, especially when we're talking about something and scratching an itch that we really need to take care of and it's very important to us, I'm going to want that long-term partnership with the vendor at this point. And I'm sure Eric would like to weigh in on that one. Helps if I unmute. Uh, sure, it's it's uh, it's easy for me to say, you know, co coming from the McAfee side of it. But uh, we, we have a lot of a lot of OEM partners in industrial space that we deal with, and, and the most popular ones are obviously antivirus, application control or allow listing, device control for removable media, um, and then passive network monitoring for your east-west traffic, 
uh, network isolation for north south, um, and then logging it all back to a sim. Um, it's really best if you can get these from the ICS vendor or from a, a, maybe a, an ICS integrator, some someone like that who will integrate it and support it, do that validation at a low level. Um, it's, uh, re remember your, your number one goal here is not to break your system. You're not just trying to get special security features. You're trying to keep your DCS running and you don't want your security features breaking your DCS and doing the very thing that you're trying to prevent in the first place. Uh, another thing, um, you know, on top of, of, of what uh, Josh and, and Dave said is, uh, actually, Dave, you probably even mentioned this, you have to look at that maintenance effort. Uh, don't just look at what it's going to do for you at FAT and on, on day one. Think about what, what kind of effort you're going to have to put into it to maintain it and keep it going for two years, three years, five years, things like that. I think that's that's really important to take that that longer um, longer approach to uh, to to you know, kind of like the ownership of that system and the and the security controls you have. Thank you. Yes. Um, so that kind of goes drives to the next question really well, which is uh, when it comes to the value, right? So how do you get value out of those things, out of those tools and solutions? to keep those uh, threats like ransomware they update? Uh, I, why would you talk to me about value? I know nothing about value. No, I, you know, it's, it's, I've been, I've been the administrator. I did administration prior to, to doing uh, security work in the industrial space for about a decade. And then I've been doing this for about 13 years or so. And what my over time of, of helping customers, um, it's it's very frustrating as a person who gives product to somebody when you just see it sitting over in a corner collecting dust and and being a space heater. Um, you, you there are certain products out there that will tell you that it just inherently fixes problems or is a static defense. You know, firewalls are always a prime example. Everybody understands is a static barrier, just like having a fence outside your house. But even the most well maintained fence or uh, with a gate a wide open doesn't do jack at this point. Uh, if, if we are, have the safest car, if it's, if it's driven poorly, which I, uh, if you never watch me drive, it would probably be uh, not the most safe vehicle to be in with. So at, you know, if you do not, if you buy static prod uh, products and you're just throwing money at and, and hope at the issue, you're gonna get your value out of that at that point. Uh, if you're not investing in your people, I'd rather see you invest in a person and do a lot of the work by, your, by yourself using a already existing tools and capabilities versus buying the blinky box that tells you when something bad happens. Because generally that ends up just sitting in the corner and no one watches it. And I think value is, is always gonna be in the eye of the beholder in this case, right? I mean, Dave, I think you were kind of touching on that. Um, there will likely never be a one size fits most value message for any solution that you bring. Um, in other words, you know, most organizations today, what I'm seeing is that the, the, how do I tie the value of the solution? Well, because it has some type of positive business outcome, right? It, it, it made me less risky. It gave me more visibility. It did, you know, reduce, gave me time. It gave me money, right? There's some type of positive business outcome um, that's going to, to come and, and that's what they connect the value to. And so, again, there's not going to be a one size fits all. Um, sometimes that's going to come in the form of accelerating digital transformation, right? Dave said it first, I'm going to say it second. Um, that, again, is a journey um, while you're trying to, you know, but you need to also, as you go through that, that digital transformation process, right? Organizations are saying, yeah, but I can't just magically connect everything. I need to maintain security or, or, or even improve security. Uh, maybe it's helping to manage the risk of the organization, right? Protect the core business or empower um, adherence to audit and compliance programs, right? Maybe that's your that's your big uh, your big stick that you have to have to measure yourself against. So 
connecting those capabilities, right, within the solution um, to those positive business outcomes then addresses specific pain points around that value driver, right, and demonstrates a way that you can then measure it. Um, and, and that tends to be a great way for end users to extract value, right? So you kind of go through that process. What do I need this thing to do, right? And again, maybe it's empowering the people that Dave was talking about to be more efficient, to be more effective, to do more with the same number of people um, that I can do that. And then how do I, how do I measure that? Um, with regards to specific threats like ransomware, I think providing end users with improved visibility across their infrastructure, um, including like some type of early warning detection system is really what's gonna help reduce the likelihood that ransomware can take over an entire facility. Um, you know, the ransomware just doesn't you know, magically show up at your doorstep. There's typically four, five, six different steps that have occurred before that, um, that, that have, are now enabling that ransomware to be um, moved and, and propagated within the environment. Um, but, you know, once ransomware does get uh, an initial foothold from that, you know, that spear phishing attack or something like that, um, continuous education for users throughout the organization, I personally believe is a critical component to battling ransomware because there's never going to be a silver bullet for that. What do you think, Eric? Yeah, and you, you hear this, you hear this a lot, uh, especially I, I think um, you know, on the ICS side, maintain your systems, keep your security software up to date. Um, and and I, I put the caveat in there to match the platform that you're securing. Um, but, and I'll, I'll try to come back to that in a sec. Uh, Update your security uh, content. Um, you know, the, the security implementation you do, the, the controls you put in place, um, that work doesn't end when you're done with FAT. It, it just starts. It's the beginning of that. And, and you're owning the system and you're maintaining it for years. And you are going to have to change this notion that you can go into FAT and freeze the uh you know the 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 build of windows and freeze the build of ovation or whatever your your dcs is and freeze the build of security like mcafee and say okay it worked today and it's going to continue to work until you know five years from now and we're just going to run it into the ground um i'm seeing a lot less of that um what i am seeing a lot of is they're changing one of those platforms. They're updating Windows or they're updating the DCS, um, or sometimes they're putting a very new version of security on a very old platform. Um, it's, and it's, it's not gonna be easy, but it's gonna be really important to try to keep your, you, know, you have your, your OS hardware platform, your DCS software and, and equipment and things like that in your cybersecurity. Try to keep them on the same page. Try to keep them uh, together and, and, and up to date. A lot harder than it sounds, but, but that's, that's gonna be important. Then I like to tell people, think about the who and the how. Um, who is going to perform certain parts of things? Who, who is going to monitor certain things? Who is going to, to uh, be implementing certain security controls? And, and how are you going to keep maintaining them? Um, and, and generally I say, have the plant system engineers and, and maintainers manage the AV, application control, removable media, log collection, and a lot of the network security, turn those into system administrator tasks. There's generally, when, once you kind of get that going, um, there's, there's not a whole lot of thinking or you, you don't have to be a security expert to make these work. You just need to keep them up to date. So it's it's more of a sysadmin job and, and make sure that those are running without impeding the system. However, on the other side, the, the attacks that we're starting to see, you know, especially with ransomware, they're becoming more sophisticated and require deeper security expertise. So to stop these attacks and react to these attacks, um, the, the, end, uh, the end users, the plants, uh, they, they need a SOC, they need, um, 
to get logs and telemetry out where they can be analyzed by trained security analysts, not the system administrators that are sitting at the plant. Uh, so this might be this might be an IT team. Um, it might be uh, a managed service, something like that. And then that that data gets processed with more modern solutions where, where they can be a little bit more agile and uh, they can use things like machine learning, uh, AI. Um, but the, the point is to get those logs and telemetry out of the plant um, into the hands of security analysts. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to say it here, maybe into the cloud where you can do, you know, you can leverage cloud type security controls without hitting, uh, you know, without hitting the plant, without worrying about, okay, am I, am I going to break, break the system? No, you're just extracting data and, and using it, um, you know, using it the, the best you can. Um, and, 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 and even in addition to this, I think, I think we're going to eventually move into a situation where we have, we're able to take obfuscated information from the security controls and, and from the DCS um, and be able to share that with your security provider, really, really the, the DCS vendor and, and let, let the DCS vendor um, use that data and it's obfuscated so they don't know exactly what's going on, but they can, uh, they can identify trends, what's going on here, and then use that to develop uh, indicators of compromise that then they can feed back to the customers to have them be better, uh, better prepared for attacks. And I'm just going to pile on one final on that one. Um, again, going back to ransomware, just got to keep in mind that ransomware is a monetization of compromise. It is not really what we're, it's not a wildfire, even though we had some situations, not even using the names of what happened in the past, where things just went rampant and went everywhere. But you got to keep in mind that most ransomware today, the, the only way it actually makes sense for most most capabilities or issues is that they're wanting to get paid and they want you to know about it. Uh, otherwise, it's just burning down your infrastructure. So uh, the we if we are not properly monitoring uh, and and keeping a vigilance with this stuff, uh, no matter how many good good things you're actually doing or how many good technologies you have, if you're not properly maintaining, then you're just going to have to invest at, and eventually with someone who's with you to on how you're going to restore to good good state, how we're going to get to bat, known good, and and invest on recovery at that point. Thank you. So uh, I, you know, I've heard some elements of your throughout the first few questions, but uh, want to kind of take a little bit of step back on the next one. So how do you bridge the gap between OT and IT? Um, and how, how do you get them to work together to buy, build that unified, comprehensive program? Dave, I'll pick on you again. Yeah, it, it's it's been a long time, as both of us know, uh, of, of marriage counseling or or being the the therapist. Uh, when this stuff comes back around at some time at this point. And, and I, my strongest talent, uh, strongest talent or the strongest item I always tell people to going in there is having empathy and, and doing some kind of translation. Um, I try to bridge that between the people because they're going to be immediately hating each other already. You're, you're telling one side or the other side, no, or you're telling if you're fighting with implementing something that's going to impact business or or impact, it's going to cause struggles. Uh, especially, you know, early days of doing this decade plus ago, we were handing the plant manager uh, the sim logs, uh, intrusion detection uh, alarms. They already got alarm fatigue. Uh, uh, the um, allow listing of the application control hits, the antivirus hits. Suddenly now they're security people while they're trying to keep the plant going. And so ultimately. Uh, if you if you are make sure the person is not an overworked person all to begin with, and we're back to the other question, which was empowering them with the proper tools to do the job, or or possibly partnering with a company that could come in and augment that person who is Superman, Superwoman, making sure the thing properly runs all the time and provide them the help when they need it. Uh, just like once in a while, sending my kid to daycare just so I can actually take a nap. Uh, so it, it, it's it's really helpful to. Uh, have that empathy, understand that they can't see your blind spot and it maybe requires bringing in a third party to listen to and say the same words to the person and then they maybe listen to you at that point or explaining with the why I'm, I'm currently asking you to do this. It's not just because I said so. 
there has to be buy-in on both sides. And if you don't have the proper support from the above to uh, do the task, then it doesn't matter. We're just, no, we're just gonna fight. Uh, so uh, be empathetic, do whatever you want to do to try to make friends on the other side, but, and realize you're gonna have to do some give and take. Yeah, that is, that is so true. I, I've been on calls um, presenting for security for, for ICS customers where I was, liter I was literally introducing the, O2 pe the, the OT people at a company to the IT people at the same company. I was the person making the introductions and I didn't work there. Um, and, and, and it was, it was actually kind of fun at times to, as, as, as they get to, to know each other. And sometimes it is, it is often, there, there are conflicts, right? The, the OT people keep saying these, these IT guys are trying to impose these things that they're just supposed to do. And they're going to break my plant and they're going to trip the plant. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to be in trouble. And, and, but I've actually heard the opposite. I have, I have heard on many occasions, IT security people telling me, Eric, I don't want to touch that, that equipment. I know I'm going to break it. I'm afraid I'm, I'm going to break that equipment. So what I, and, and I've really stepped up this rhetoric as, as the, the guys that on the panel know is, is what we have to do now is we have to let each uh, IT and OT do what they do best. Uh, the, the OT stakeholders, they need to keep their plant running. They need to be able to get, get that software. I'm, I'm going to call it commodity security software, like I was talking about, AV and endpoint security. And these things we've been doing, at least in IT, we've been doing them for decades. And we, we know how to generally do them. Let the OT people manage that put it on there, make sure it's not breaking their system and, and let them do that. They keep the system running. O uh, IT, in the context of, of I ICS security here, they then specialize in preventing sophisticated attacks. And in their job, um, because they know the O2, the o oh, oh, man, the OT guys are saying um, they're, they're keeping things safe the IT guys can then do, they can look for sophisticated attacks. They can do the analysis. They can do that, you know, the, the, the real security analytics and things that, that they know how to do that, that the, the OT guys just don't have, have time for. I think I'm tripping up because as a vendor, I'm supposed to be saying IT, OT convergence about five or six times per, per minute. And I'm just, I'm just, I'm not doing very well with that. Um, so, so we're putting you know, we're putting that first line of defense in the plant, and and also kind of the the instrumentation uh, for security, and and so we we put that in the hands of the OT guys. They get that in there, and then telemetry and logs come out of the system that the IT guys can use, and and then you start to talk about the comfort level of the feedback loop. Do I want the IT guys to be able to do? Um, like EDR, and can they maybe go back into the system and get more information if they think something's going on? Can they do some kind of response? Or do you want to say, and I know this might be hard for nerds, um, have, the, have the IT guy pick up the phone and call the OT guy <laughs> and say, so, something ain't right here. I see something weird going on on drop 211. Can... Uh, can we talk about it? Um, I think I know what to do, but I don't want to do it until, you know, you're, are you ready for me to do this or do you want me to walk you through it? Uh, something like that. But the, the big message that, that um, and, and I didn't invent this, I'm kind of hearing it from, from a number of angles, is let IT and OT do what they do best. There, there's this convergence thing, they're, they're converging in that they have to work together. They're not converging in the sense that they're the same and that OT systems are suddenly going to just become managed like IT systems. 
that can't happen. It's a different environment, but we do have to have some level of convergence in how we work together. And you're also going to see fewer people involved doing that. And, and so uh, you're, you're going to have to adapt to that, but there, you have to take both angles. Josh? No, those are great points, Dave and, and Eric. Um, you know, in 2020, we wrote a blog about this um, through our, and it was published through our partnership with the uh, ISA Global Cybersecurity Alliance. Um, you know, really before we can even begin to have hope about, you know, having it, this unified, effective, comprehensive cybersecurity program where IT and OT are, are playing together. Um, first and foremost, Dave, you kind of hit on this. We have to drop our respective egos at the figurative door um, and come to the table with, with you know, inquisitiveness, with empathy um, for the other side, right? Um, this is gonna take everyone consuming a, a small slice of humble pie and realizing that we simply cannot know everything about everything. Um, it means that we need to ask questions and then stay quiet, right? Actively listen, um, resist the temptation to jump to conclusions and recommendations. Well, this is how we do it in IT and you should be able to do it just as easy because those are all just Windows boxes or, you know, well, in OT, we can't do anything because, you know, they said we can never do anything. And, you know, no, in my humble opinion, that first step of that journey, right, is to establish an effective collaboration, right, between IT and OT. Understand we're both in this together. We don't exist without one another, right? The, 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 the IT side wouldn't need to exist if there wasn't a generator or a pump or a valve or a something, right, doing something on the other side and vice versa, right? We can't, we can't do digital transformation stuff and be effective and be um, fantastic at what we're doing um, without IT supporting us and, and keeping, you know, things happening in, in, in that way. And so, um, again, getting everybody on, you know, IT uh, stakeholders, OT stakeholders, get everybody to the table um, and, and, and work through it. And then, Again, continue to just let that marriage counseling, that empathy, that inquisitiveness um, continue to grow, continue to take some roots, and then and then blossom across both environments. Um, that's what's going to get you to that unified, effective cybersecurity program um, where everybody realizes we're in this together. And I'll add one real quickie on that. Um, maybe you also need to re-ask the question in a different way. If uh, as every parent has, if you had your kids walk up to you today right now and ask for a thousand bucks and not tell you what they wanted for, you probably immediately say no. Uh, but if they said, I need, uh, I'm not going to Vegas and blowing it all in black. I'm, I'm, I, there's this thing I need to buy that get, you know, I like to buy this thing that will help me do this. Then there may be ways of us finding a way to do it without giving you a thousand bucks. Uh, so it, there, there could be ways for me to get the same kind of visibility or the same kind of control, but it may be a situation of building a walled garden around the thing that you don't want me to touch, and then I just monitor traffic in and out, or I have you do some things with the tools that you already have there and provide me with logs or some other capability, and I prove to you that it's not going to do anything, <laughs> or, or have you do it in a test environment and prove at that point, or as a pilot program and, and that kind of, there's gonna be ways to phase it in to prove that it's not going to cause all this disruption and issue. And, and you can be insistent about it, and, but it'd be empathetic during your, your questioning and say, well, I, this is why I want this kind of situation. Um, so what kind of use cases uh, to, to do you, can you demonstrate? Like what, what are good use cases we can use to show value that's being delivered when we're doing these, deploying these types of things. Um, what what kind of things can you can you talk to uh, to to help our audience? You know, set a path for success. Okay, Eric. I'll, sure, I'll uh, I'll take a few here. Um, I think. Um, you know, kind of what we've had in the past is is our approach has been to go after these unintentional random attacks like I was talking about. Um, I think it's a little bit harder to provide value when you're when you're talking about um, oh it's just it's just a you know a virus from some bored 13 year old that we accidentally put on the plant. Um, 
trying to trying to you know create value for that is is hard, and and to show the value of what you're doing is hard. Um, I think you can establish it more by talking about those targeted attacks. And, and like, like Dave said, the monetization of random ra ransomware has, has really shown that, that there is value because there, there is a reason for the attack and they're not, um, it's, it's not like, oh, I got you, I embarrassed you and now I'm gonna go away. There's, there's a lot more to that. So you can show the value of, of the expense of it and, and that they're really committed to, to what they're doing. Um, some, of the, uh, some of the use cases that, that I often uh, see that, that people wanna talk about or, or that they really care about, um, especially more now with, the, with, with phishing campaigns is, is compromised credentials. Um, an attacker uh, might fish login credentials for an OT system, uh, from documentation that's on the IT side, because a, a lot of times it's it's not if if you compromise if if you send someone a phishing email and you get malware on that person's laptop, you're not necessarily getting right into the OT system, but you might get information that will help you get into into the OT system, like the login credentials for for something there. So then you can turn that and then use a different vector to get in and use those compromised credentials. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and so it's, it's good to be able to come up with some way to, to, uh, to detect that. Uh, you can look at behavior, um, uh, you know, behavior analytics is a big thing you, you can look at in, in doing that. Um, network monitoring is, is very good and, and then tying that into the SIM to be able to look for, for attempted logins and, and logins that might not make sense based on when they happen or how many times they happen or, or just what operations are going on, things like that. Um, the big one that a lot of us have talked about uh, for uh, especially for the last year and a half is the compromised supply chain. And uh, you know, this, in, in this case, the attackers do not need to enter the plant to attack it, they will. They'll let the, the good guys carry the malware in for them. Um, so you need to look for malware at a number of points in that path, uh, not not just with antivirus on the endpoint, but look at okay, how did it um, how did it get on this this engineer's USB stick? He thinks he has an update, a mandatory update for his DCS, and instead it's it's malware. Um, you want to try to catch that on the IT side. You want to try to catch that when they go through maybe their device control. You want to have your AV. You want to have, you want to check a number of different vectors because if it might have been signed or if the engineer thinks it's a patch, a legitimate patch, they might be able to bypass some of the controls you thought were going to stop that. So that's a really important one where you have to use lots of different techniques not just antivirus, but HIPs, network monitoring, um, checking your thread intel, what's going on elsewhere, Who, where else are they trying this? Um, machine learning might help you with that one. And, and, and then always it can always come back to allow this stuff. Um, the, the last one I'll talk about is the, the rogue insider. And it kind of, the way I describe it, it's usually kind of tied to that compromised supply chain where it's not necessarily somebody who's trying to attack the plant, but might be, um, subverting the rules because they have to do something. I, I've seen a lot of this. Engineers are very, very good at finding ways to do what they need to do on the system, no matter how much you try to control them. And so once again, behavior analytics and saying, well, should this really be going on um, at this time? One of my favorite use cases from when I was doing nuclear power was simply to have an alert that went off, we, we used uh, network intrusion detection for this. Uh, we had an alert every time somebody tried to change the control logic on a controller. That shouldn't, nor, for at least for, for that, that vertical, that should never, ever, ever happen unless you're in a fuel outage. So if somebody's changing the logic on a controller, just at a random time, you, you know they're doing something wrong. And it might be some malware um, that some, somebody went in and they were doing some work they weren't supposed to do and they triggered something, some malware went off and started making changes. So that's, those, are, those are three things to look at.
several use cases come to mind um, from my experience, um, specifically connected to this webinar. Um, to protect the innocent, I'll, I'll change the names. We'll call them the Ask Me Widget Company. Um, and, and in this one particular instance I'm thinking of is their IT SOC department, which had been, as per executive management, uh, made responsible for managing risk across the organization. Um, and what happened was they were struggling to meet uh, and get adequate visibility across the manufacturing area. So in IT, good, they deployed some solutions, um, but when it came to manufacturing and how that was connected, who was connected to it, who had remote access to it, um, very, very limited visibility. Um, and so what we did, we went in, we talked to them, right? And, and first and foremost, again, back to what I was saying a, a couple minutes ago was, understand what it is that you're trying to solve for, and then how are you gonna measure the success of that before you begin throwing technology at the problem? Um, so visibility to them meant an adequate understanding of uh, you know, an up-to-date list of systems, devices, how they interacted with one another, what their security posture was, so like a vulnerability uh, a management type of, of, of look, um, and, and, and then also understanding and being able to label the criticality of those devices, those systems to the manufacturing process itself. What did disaster recovery look like? So if one of those goes off, if one of those, you know, to, to, to Eric's point, right, one of those gets compromised, what happens? How do we recover from that? Stuff like that. Um, so the solution for them didn't start out with technology. It actually started out with an architecture review. Um, we, you know, and, and so our team goes in and actually said, hey, we need, to, we need to sit down before we start throwing technology at this problem and understand how this stuff is even supposed to look. What documentation do you have? The outcome from that engagement was um, a lot better relationship, first of all, between IT and OT, which was, which was great. Um, and, and, and the deliverable from that um, got both groups to understand, hey, we need increased visibility um, into that manufacturer area. It also highlighted a couple of unknown things that the manufacturing folks didn't even know. Um, like so there were some uh, remote access things that uh, vendors and, and system integrators had turned on um, or left on uh, that, they, that they didn't know about. So, so again, give them some of that visibility, um, understanding where true risk posture was. Um, and then it said, hey, you know what? We need to make an investment um, in something that's gonna provide 24 by seven monitoring of this area, not just a, a single snapshot in time. So um, for them, again, that was something that, you know, we didn't start out with technology. We started out with, with people and processes and kind of understanding what we, knit, what we knew. And then um, from there, right, we were able to say the, the next step in your maturation process is to implement some of this stuff with people, processes, maybe procure some technology that solves this challenge um, and get those people trained up on how to do that. At the end of the day, the beautiful part was both teams, IT and OT got together, put the problem in front of them, figured out what the resolution was, right? And then they were able to go say, okay, now we can you know, put these two things as a priority that will reduce our risk in this way. And we're able to measure it by you know, taking these you know, data pieces out of it. So Dave, what's your thoughts? You know, I, I, it's again, I, I, you can almost hear the theme coming out of me every time I answer a question, but the, it, it goes back to, uh, these are just tools, uh, frankly, no matter what, even just if you, if you're a control engineer, you know, that, that just the tools extend the, the capability of the person or the process and, and one tool just subs in for another tool. And, and if you're not effectively using the tool, then you're my dad trying to build a house. Uh, the, situation at this point is that if you are not if you're looking at a problem is the thing that i'm doing going to fix the problem otherwise i'm just working and and I, it could be something as simple as we have situations where you know it doesn't make sense to the whole stack of, of pcs and a virtual cluster and all these products for a single machine and a a controller doing solar I mean, it just doesn't make sense. So uh, we've had situations where we had customers where they just all they needed was help patching once in a while on a quarterly basis, maybe with their Windows machines and checking to make sure that the, the patches on, on Ovation were OK and no, there was no alarms they're missing or something that's really weird. So we send a person, a field service person around with a CD, just a CD and, and walked around and, and did and updated machines that way uh, and some wind farms and some solar locations. 
it, it, but you have to look at it as a solution of, it, you know, just buying the thing to make it go away almost never makes it go away. So it, you, the use cases I'm saying uh, are when you, the best case is when you find the thing that augments the person who does the thing. And I know a lot of my peers would throw stuff in my head for saying this. It doesn't matter if it's your operational guys or and gals, or it's the IT side of the house. It's the same business. We don't need to be yelling at each other. So the success is whoever's going to be monitoring it and effectively understanding and, and responding to it correctly should be the one who's in charge of it. And we need to empower that person to be able to do what they need to do. So uh, thanks everybody, lots of really good discussion. We had quite a few good questions up here too that we're gonna try to uh, uh, to get get through. Um, so uh, we're, and we're, I don't think we're gonna get through all of them in the next seven, eight minutes that we have left, but let's see what we can do. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and start with this one that based on what's popping up uh, glaringly obvious to me. So. So if an asset inventory is great for checking audit boxes, but not necessarily great for protecting your environment, what qualifies as good enough? Where do we draw the line in terms of depth of an inventory? Josh, you want to start? Yeah, I, I think this goes right to what we were just talking about is, is understanding, okay, if, if I, if I you know, go in and I, and I check the box and I, I've done some good asset inventory stuff, is that good enough, right? Um, well, at that point, you have to say, well, does IT agree that's good enough? Does OT agree that's good enough? Does the business agree from a risk acceptance perspective that that's good enough? To so just know what I have, know how it's communicating and things like that. Or do I need to get better, right? Are there regulatory fines that are going to be impacted if we do nothing? Is there going to be safety implications if we do nothing? If the next major storm comes through and takes this or that thing out, you know, what's our recovery process look like? What if we do nothing? Um, you know, that risk acceptance piece, right? And I, I totally agree. Checkbox security is 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 hard, um, but it can be done. Um, and 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 the more boxes you check, oftentimes the lower the risk becomes. But there's a balance. I. I guarantee you there's a balance. It's, it's not spend a million dollars to prevent a million dollars. That's not the way risk works. So Dave, Eric, anything on that? Just, I agree. Yeah, you don't want to spend any time uh, checking the level of lead paint you have on the handrails when you, uh, so getting a full inventory of your environment is not going to really help very much. What you start with, it always is, is what's most important to business and the process. And, and if we can do that and then check what must be done regulatory wise, then then everything else is gravy on top of that. And maybe you can put some tools that help you with some of the visibility and catch most of it. That's all I'll say on that one. Awesome. Let me uh, go to the next one. So um, here, here's a good question uh, that we are we all face and all of you can give good input on. Um, so for plants that have been operational for many years, it can be a major challenge to convince OT system owners to invest in new cyber protections much less to convince them to allow information to leave the environment and be placed into the hands of a separate IT department like a SOC. Can you recommend resources or strategies to help convince OT system owners to make such investments? Who wants to take one? one? Dave, I'm going to pick on you again. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll do it. This is a very common issue. Like I just basically said in the last question, which was the, uh, uh, if you ask in a different way versus I'm coming in and I'm here to save the day, um, I will tell you most plant sides are going to immediately tell you no and hide, or if you try to implement something, they'll do some dirty tricks to you that they don't even know. Like, uh, I know of a number <laughs> of ways of hooking up your box to only to power, no network, uh, that kind of stuff, uh, or, or hiding it in a certain area so it only sees one thing. Uh, but they, they, they did malicious compliance, as they would call it. So, uh, if, you know, honestly, uh, if you ask Tell them what you're trying to get and, and, and phase in your approach on here we'll do it and we'll do it in this one plant or we'll do it in this one location. And if you can double dip and give them some kind of operational visibility or operational help, hey, I saw your backup jobs haven't been running forever. That's happened more than once when you threw a sim in there. You're not seeing bad guys attacking the system. You find out things haven't been running like you thought they were uh, and show them a little operational help. And, and some visibility they never got before, 
they may actually help. They may help you at the end of this. Um, so it may require throwing it on a simulator. It may require throwing it on a, 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 a test environment to prove to them that it's not going to be. It could be beneficial. Yeah, and I'll, I'll kind of I'll try to combine this with the one from from Thomas about you know how do you how do you get people to actually act on this? Um, there there are a, a lot of things, but one one of the things that I ran into, especially when when I used to work uh, for for a DCS implementer, was people would often say you know you'd say oh well, let's we need to do this we need to do this we need to do this and. Sometimes the, the sleazier way than, than like even saying no is to say yes, eventually, like we'll get to that. And what I heard a lot of was, um, yeah, I agree with you, but I'm not going to do it that way. I'm going to do it internally because it's free. If I have my people do it, it's free. And so I, I like to go back to that who and how, um, who is going to do it and how are they going to do it? And a lot of times like in, in talking about extracting data out and the, and the, and the customer says, well, I, you know, I'm not comfortable with that. But you kind of, I think one way to win that is to go back and say, okay, well, who's, who's going to look at that? You have all this data. You have the ability um, to take the data you have. You don't even need to install anything else. Um, you don't have to buy much more. You just need someone to look at this and, and say, and, and kind of get into that conversation of, okay, how are you gonna go about looking at this? Who's gonna do it? You don't have anybody. You're, you're, you're cutting your, your number of personnel down and, and go that way. And then kind of going back to more of how to get somebody to act and, and, and both Dave and Josh kind of talked about this too. Start, start with something you can do, something small, something that you can, something simple, not too expensive, do that and then, um, and then work from there. I came back from uh, a plant, a nuclear plant where we installed uh, network IPS. And it was an IDS. We were, we were monitoring east-west traffic. And a week after I got back to the office, I got an email with uh, like 12 pages of uh, IP address pairs and port, you know, TCP ports and things like that. And said, uh, can you explain these to me? And just giving them the ability to see that network traffic and look at it, um, they they suddenly had all this visibility in, in what was going on in their network. And they, they sent that back to us and said, hey, wh where are these packets coming from? And it turns out that I, I took them to the, the DCS engineers. They, they found that they, they had been using the wrong NIC on a lot of their, when they were setting up their services, they were using the wrong NIC. When I showed them the network traffic, they said, oh man, I wish I had this. Um, when we were trying to fix it, I was wondering, it, he said, I was wondering where those packets went. And so you, you, can, start to, you can start to show value that way um, by, by using those tools, maybe not necessarily to just help with security, but also to help, help the engineers um, solve some of their problems. Thank you. And it uh, looks like we're uh, out of time. Um, so appreciate uh, all of you. So if you, we didn't get to your question, we will follow up separately and, and try to get uh, everyone's questions answered. Uh, quite a lot of really good question um, questions out there. Uh, I wanted to wrap up by just at first thanking the panelists for your time and sharing your knowledge with the community as we build this community up. Um, and I wanted to thank everybody for joining us uh, at, and sharing your time. Y'all are doing great things to keep critical infrastructure intact and working for all of us uh, to be able to turn on our lights in the morning and, and brew our, our very, very, very important coffee. So um, thank you to everybody for, for joining us. And uh, yeah, look forward to next time.